Okay, I think that uh, uh, we may start. Uh, welcome everyone to the Center for European Studies. Um, and this event is the director's uh, seminar, and I'm the director. <laughs> I'm Grzegorz Ekirt, uh, uh, I'm professor of government and, um, and the director of the Center for uh, European Studies. Uh, I think that uh, we've been thinking about this event for uh, for uh, several months now, um, and I, you know, when we started making arrangements, I worried that maybe by the time we have it uh, in November, things will calm down and nothing really terrible uh, will be happening in in Ukraine. And but you know, the last few days uh, uh, tells me that we have a perfect timing because things do not look uh, well uh, in, uh, in any way. Uh, the seminar, the director's seminar, was designed to discuss the challenges facing the European Union. And, um, uh, and of course, after 20-something uh, year of completely boring stuff, uh, negotiating quota about cod fishing and uh, distribution of uh, agricultural resources, subsidies, and all those other things, suddenly we have one dramatic crisis uh, in Europe after another. So, uh, you know, the big financial crisis and the, and the euro crisis, which is still not resolve uh, follow up by tremendous institutional crisis of the of the European Union um, you know the last election to the European Parliament you realize that uh, this is the only parliament in Europe which has gigantic disloyal opposition uh, people who want to roll back or dissolve the European Union that has never happened in Europe in the last uh, 50 years and of course, the last thing is uh, uh, is the crisis which started in the spring, involving Ukraine and Russian policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine. Um, you know, it's it's very hard to uh, not to have those historical parallels uh, to 1938, um, and and I think that you know, going through different things. Uh, thinking about this uh, seminar today, I, I just came across the two quotations uh, which I would like to uh, just uh, uh, give you as some, you know, way of thinking about those events. So, you know, in 1938, uh, in NSDAP Congress, Adolf Hitler uh, said the following thing. I'm simply demanding that the oppression of three and a half million Germans in Czechoslovakia cease and that an alienable right to self-determination take its place, right? And Sergei Lavrov just, you know, not long ago said, uh, I reiterate, uh, we are talking about protecting our citizens and compatriots, about protecting the most fundamental human right, the right to life and nothing more. Right, so even in terms of language and, and narratives, those things are really worryingly, uh, worryingly uh, similar. Now, uh, we have uh, a, a great panel uh, today. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, that you traveled uh, uh, so far away uh, um, um, to, to help us to understand uh, what's going on uh, in Ukraine and what are the potential solutions for the uh, for the uh, conflict with Russia? So we have uh, three people uh, 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 we would dream to get for uh, for the panel like this. Uh, so let me introduce Gwendolyn Sasse, uh, who is a professor of comparative politics at Oxford University and professorial fellow at Nuffield College. Uh, Gwyn had uh, her PhD uh, from London School of Economics, uh, uh, has been working uh, at Oxford for some time. Uh, uh, she, she wrote the book uh, on Crimean question, how uh, perceptive, uh, uh, and that book became uh, uh, very famous and, and gathered a lot of acclaim, uh, published in 2007 in Cambridge University uh, Press. Uh, Paul Danieri, uh, who is now the pr provost and ex executive vice chancellor of uh, uh, California University um, uh, at Riverside, uh, moved there from, uh, from Florida University 
uh, where uh, where he was the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences for uh, for almost eight years, I guess. Uh, uh, Paul uh, is a polka scientist. Uh, he has his PhD from Cornell uh, University and and uh, published widely on East European and post-Soviet affairs. Uh, his textbook, International Politics, Power, and Purpose in Global Affairs, uh, is one of the most successful uh, uh, books on uh, uh, on that topic. And Luc Anway, uh, our dear old friend, uh, uh, is Associate Professor of Political Science at University of, uh, of Toronto. Uh, he's known for work on uh, hybrid uh, regimes and competitive authoritarianism. Uh, uh, he is also expert on Ukraine, has been watching uh, events uh, 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 in Ukraine uh, for uh, for many years. Now, before I, I, I turn to our guest, uh, uh, let me thank uh, uh, the Ukrainian Research Institute and Professor Sergei Prohi uh, for co-organizing with us uh, this event. I want to mention just in, uh, 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 in passing that we are having another uh, big event uh, uh, next week on the situation in Europe and, and Ukraine with Radosław Sikorski, the former uh, uh, foreign minister of, uh, of Poland, and that event is also co-organized with, uh, uh, with the uh, Ukrainian Research Institute. So as you see, we are accepting Ukraine as a full member of the, uh, of the European Union already in, uh, uh, in the center. Uh, and also, let me thank uh, our wonderful staff uh, at the Center for European Studies for helping us to organize this event. So the rules of the game are our panelists will speak for uh, for approximately 10 minutes each and then we'll open the discussion. And this will be followed by reception upstairs to uh, which you are all invited uh, to continue the discussion in a more informal way. Uh, so we'll uh, uh, start with, uh, with Luke and Wei. So uh, the last time I gave this talk in Toronto, I was booed. So we'll see if that happened this time. And my, my in-laws, who are from Peshawar, Pakistan, were very worried because when they don't like you in Pakistan, it's more than booing. Right? And so my, my, my mother-in-law was, don't give talks on Ukraine. <laughs> but I, I ignored her, and we'll see what happens. Um, so what's interesting is that um, this crisis began in Ukraine, but discussion has almost moved entirely um, that, to about Russia. And indeed, the focus on Russia makes a lot of sense. I mean, without Russia, you would not have the war. That's clear. Um, and the resolution of the, of the crisis cr cr uh, obviously currently hinges on Russia. On Russia. Um, you know, there's a villain in this story, and Putin is the villain. At the same time, I don't think that Putin's invasion of Ukraine was inevitable. I mean, if you look historically, many countries have irredentist claims that are never fulfilled. And that we have to, and my argument here is that Euromaidan and the, and the subsequent events created an opportunity for uh, an opening for Putin to make a lot of trouble. And I want to, and specifically two aspects of this crisis. One, uh, the collapse of the state that happened just before Yanukovych left and after Yanukovych left. And second, the profound alienation of the population in, in Donbass uh, in eastern Ukraine towards the new government in Kiev. So those two things, I think, did not make uh, war inevitable, but they certainly provided opportunity for Putin to make a great deal of trouble. And I think to understand why this happened, why Euromaidan turned out this way, you have to understand two factors. The first is the incredibly brittle character of the Yanukovych authoritarian regime. That it was a highly disciplined and united, and thus, um, unlikely to compromise in the face of protest, but at the same time insufficiently strong to engage in the kind of large-scale, high-intensity repression that would have been necessary to uh, suppress the protests. Second, I think Ukraine's regional divisions that both facilitated large-scale uh, mobilization against Yanukovych, um, but also encouraged the use of highly divisive symbols that helped Putin in his effort to uh, create problems in the East. Now, first, I want to talk about the brittle authoritarian party state that created by Yanukovych. Um, Yanukovych created probably the strongest authoritarian regime in, in post-Soviet Ukrainian history, a very disciplined party. 
which, um, which was much more tightly disciplined than had existed before. Um, and indeed, when they came to power in 2010, despite the fact that Yanukovych came to power you know, with, on paper with very weak powers, um, the 2004 constitution which gave him, did not give him that much authority, he was able to use his party to control um, and tightly discipline the parliament and change the constitution. So his control um, over, over the parliament you know, made it much less, you know, made it possible for him simply not to compromise. At the same time, while you, uh, Yanukovych's authoritarian regime was strong by Ukrainian standards, it was weak by global standards. And indeed, part of the problem for Yanukovych was that most people in the coalition could survive without the survival of the person of Yanukovych. Now, there's a lot of discussion of the Yanukovych family, of the sort of inner core, um, of people who were, who, whose very survival was contingent on the survival of Yanukovych. But one of the striking things about the family is that it was incredibly small. You know, when journalists have tried to come up with, they come up with about eight people, and that's basically not enough people who are deeply invested in the regime to, who are willing to sort of take, carry out any risk for the regime's survival um, to survive any kind of serious crisis. So we compare it to sort of personalist regimes in Syria or Iraq, you know, where you have the family, is to put it simply, much larger and able to infiltrate the entire state and therefore willing to engage in the kind of risky behavior that would be necessary to put down large-scale protests. And indeed, the, 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 um, the regime was dominated by sort of very opportunistic autocrats who were basically unwilling to engage in risky auto, uh, authoritarian behavior, which I think you know, partly led to the collapse of the regime. Now, first of all, um, and second element is this sort of regional divisions, which have been discussed extensively. And indeed, the, the regional divisions were very important to the success of Yarmaidan because Western Ukrainians, West, Western Ukrainians were disproportionately um, present in the protests, and they provide some of the shock troops. Um, if we look at the share of people who died on Euromaidan, it's disproportionately people from Western Ukraine. And they provided the kind of passionate support that was necessary to keep the crisis going. At the same time, Yanukovych um, was sufficiently, he controlled the parliament and therefore was intransigent and could afford not to compromise. But his regime was brittle. And, was, and what's actually striking about Yanukovych's regime's behavior during Yamamaidan is how moderate, in some ways, the response was. Now, of course, there was a lot of violence, you know, low-level violence, which is awful for those who suffer from it, but very little of the large-scale public repression um, that would be necessary to put down protests. And I, one of the things I found fr um, fascinating was that they were unwilling even to shut off the electricity on Euromaidan. You, know, you hear they had these major protests and they kept the electricity going. And I was there in December. And I asked, well, why, aren't, why don't they shut the, off the electricity? Is it that hard? And they said they weren't willing to shut off the electricity because they didn't want to harm the businesses nearby. Now, if a regime doesn't even have the guts to shut off the electricity because it's going to harm some oligarch's businesses nearby, that is not a regime that's willing to take the kind of risks and sacrifices necessary uh, for survival. And indeed, when um, Yanukovych engaged in large-scale repression, the horrible events on February 20th with the sniper attacks, which almost roughly 100 people died, the regime immediately collapsed. You know, it was the party of regions, which had remained relatively united until then. It's completely disintegrated. The state itself disintegrated. And you know, that, the thing about this breakdown of the state is it both made possible the um, collapse of, of Yanukovych, but also opened the way to civil war, I mean, to, uh, to war. And I think what's here important is that the regional divide was important here in this poem, because Yanukovych could have retaken Euromaidan Square. It, you know, from a military point of view, it's a relatively limited space. But by that point, the entire authoritarian state in the West 
had collapsed, and there simply was not the manpower to retake the West. So that made Yanukovych's fall inevitable. However, um, this also ushered the way to war and civil war. Now, and this is when I wanted to get the, a bit more controversial part, which is I think the regional divide also encouraged the use of highly divisive symbols that had never been used so prominently in previous opposition demonstrations. I'm referring here to portraits of Stepan Bandera and the black and red flag. Now, I want to be clear about one thing. These were not, the opposition was not fascist, was incredibly moderate, and pro-democratic. I have no, there's no question about that. However, they create, they, they, a lot, there was a lot of use of symbols that were actually genuinely confusing, and in my mind, a kind of PR disaster of epic proportions. That I think would, um, that, um, that kind of made it, made it much easier for Putin to convince those in Southeast Ukraine, which he, you know, through media, that this was a truly alien government. And so um, you have this comment, and I think this contributed to this profound alienation that emerged early, uh, in Southeast Ukraine after Yanukovych fell, in which, according to uh, polls, you know, very good poll by the Kiev International Institute of Sociology, 70% of Donbass in April thought the government in Kiev was illegal. That was, and so you have a combination of profound state collapse and alienation. I mean, that sort of, to put it mildly, makes uh, Putin's job just much easier. So on that note, thanks. Thank you, Nathan. Win, please. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. It's very nice to be back at Harvard, and I see people in the room um, from whom I've learned a lot about Ukraine, so it's a very humbling experience to talk here as well. Um, let me come at the topic so maybe slightly differently, and I think I'll also address issues to do with regional diversity um, and possibly present a slightly different angle from what you've heard from Lukan, and then hopefully that will make for a good discussion afterwards. Um, but just as a sort of a, for, for the beginning, maybe let's just think where we are. I mean, there's a conflict going on, um, in the center of Europe, over 4,000 4, people are dead. Uh, hundreds of thousands have been displaced. Uh, f about 4 million voters were disenfranchised in the last national parliamentary elections. There's a deep facto of fragmentation of the Ukrainian state. So Kiev has lost control over parts of the Donbass. Um, parts of Ukraine held separate um, elections, regional and local elections. And clearly, in the last few days, that's very clear, the ceasefire has broken down. So everybody still wants to talk about it um, almost breaking down, but I think it's clear it's not, it's not holding. Um, we've seen a lot of Cold War rhetoric uh, very quickly um, uh, reassert itself, even last autumn already, when I was a bit surprised about that. The West has been scrambling to find responses. On the one hand, I think it was easy to point um, at Russia as the villain. Um, but I think the, the story is a bit more complicated, and I think the West, and uh, we may want to discuss this later on, is part of the build-up to the conflict, in particular through uninten unintended consequences of EU policies that build in and build up expectations, which then um, can feed into dynamics. And also, West not finding responses to Russian actions also becomes part of the, the causal story of what we see um, is unfolding. And finally, also one feature which we may want to discuss further later on, perhaps we see a new political landscape um, emerging in Ukraine and the consequences of that are still open. Luka mentioned the Party of Regions has crumbled, but so have really other important political forces as well. Um, and while we still see familiar faces um, in the parliament and in the political elites, um, there's been, uh, I think, a, a more serious shakeup of the political scene. And I want to really um, go back to one thing that um, Lukan started with as well. It's, we're really left, I think, with a bit of a paradox um, because I think it's been a really surprising chain of events which nobody could have um, predicted. Um, and I would see the paradox, um, I think, probably slightly differently from you in that I don't think the Ukrainian state was all that weak um, a year ago. Um, and so that, however, makes it very important for us to understand how this could possibly um, uh, happen. So ex post, it's always um, easy to find structural explanations of why something 
had to happen. But these structural conditions, like regional diversity, for example, and several others, have been around for a long time. So they tell us very little about the timing of when something happens and then also the actual um, cause of events. So I think we should be very careful. Sometimes now you hear explanations, oh, Russia uh, simply um, had to take Crimea back because of these and these factors. But um, they, they didn't do it beforehand. Um, uh, it was, it was it's inconceivable that they would have done it, for example, had Yanukovych um, signed the association agreement with the EU. This ar arose out of a particular, as, as Lukan said, out of an opportunity that presented itself and is probably not part of a, a big strategic plan, but happened. But that makes it really, again, very important for us to look closely why that happened. So there was no, no compelling reason, um, locally driven reason, perhaps, to, to, um, uh, to do this. 2013 was not a moment when the southeast was not represented politically at the center in Kiev, for example. It was not a, a, a moment when uh, any kinds of rights of Russian speakers or ethnic Russians would have been under threat. Quite on the contrary, it, they, they, um, the, the laws on the regional use of the language in, in the southeast was, was in place. Um, it was also arguably not even a time when Russian-Ukrainian relations were particularly tense. We had seen other moments before when that was the case. Um, so all of this really, I think, points to that this is a politically created crisis and um, uh, at each step various actors and agency drove these, um, these factors along this path with, with which we couldn't have um, predicted. Um, one part of this, and, and with that I move to the discussion maybe or, or an attempt to contextualize this regional diversity or regional divides in Ukraine. We've always heard a lot about the east-west divide in, in uh, Ukraine. It's always hovered over it ever since independence and probably um, before that too. And on the one hand, yes, Ukraine has moved somewhat closer to this scenario now. But I think um, both before 2013 and now, we need to look more closely. And there are, there, there always have been, and there still are many multiple and overlapping identities. And um, I said early on in a very lively discussion with the Ukrainian Student Society already, I think the honest answer is we just don't know what the majority or what individuals right now think and if identities have shifted. It's clearly a, a sort of a fluid um, space at the moment, but the East-West split has often thought, been thought about in far too rigid terms, that it's an ethnic divide, a linguistic divide. And, and the truth of the matter is that the regional diversity in Ukraine, regional identities are political identities made up out of different things which can, can come into focus and also come out of focus again and, and are not, do not mean the same thing for every individual or any, every group in a region or a region as a whole. So also now we're not, we don't know a lot about what the, the population of Donetsk and Luhansk uh, really wants. Uh, if uh, any if surveys, which are clearly very difficult in the midst of a war, um, tell us anything, then there still seems to be a majority for support in, of the Ukrainian state in its um, current or boundaries of 2013. Um, so we have to be, I think, very careful to generalize from a, a group of very well mobilized separatists um, uh, who uh, uh, receive support and equipment from uh, Russia and, and not to generalize to the, the, the population as a, as a whole. If we actually look at, in addition to opinion polls, if we look at the election results, um, the results of the parliamentary elections more closely, um, there are actually interesting regional patterns, and maybe that is partly where a change in Ukraine's political landscape um, might come for, might manifest itself. Because if we look at um, the more detailed breakdown in the regions, we see actually some things which might surprise us. That, for example, uh, a party from uh, Lviv, Asama Pomic, did quite well in a number of southern and eastern regions. Even in Luhansk, it got about 5% of the vote. Um, in, in other parts, Kharkiv, Odessa, I think it was 7 to 8%. If we look at um, the breakdown of votes in regions like Nipopetrovsk, Saporizhia, Kharkiv, Odessa, we, and add up the parties which roughly stand for an opposition to the interim government and what will be the government now, and parties sort of roughly associated with what will probably be the coalition, um, they're actually e fairly evenly balanced, um, sort of around 30%, so a third of the vote. So that um, is uh, a shift compared to previous elections, um, and it's, I think, something we have to, have to um, pay more attention to. Um, as I say, and even in Luhansk and, and Donetsk, there, there are some of, some of this visible where at least a quarter of the population has, has voted for these parties. So this is, I think, where some of these multiple identities I talked about um, may begin to shift or perhaps at least in a crisis situation we see them um, differently. But putting kind of regional diversity in, in, in context, um, 
I would actually say it's, it's part of, um, well, first of all, that Ukraine had come further in building the state um, in its boundaries for the first time since 91, um, and that there was a, an informal balancing mechanism which, which kept the, uh, um, the state intact and stable, also compared to other parts of the former Soviet Union, maybe more stable than, than elsewhere. Um, this is, has nothing to do with easy structural reforms or perfect democratization. It doesn't, but it has a lot to do with state building and stability. Um, and these things are a trade-off, and, and, and Ukraine is probably a good example of that. And there was an informal balancing mechanism that whatever regional interests were represented at the, at the center, they still uh, uh, were aware of that they could not push through what the electoral rhetoric might have suggested, either on language or on, 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 on other issues. So um, that seemed to work, but it has broken down. So I think when we draw lessons from what we're seeing, and if we have the, the luxury as an academic from outside to think about lessons now and something else is clearly needed on the ground, um, it is around this, this issue of how to um, organize or institutionalize uh, something that's regional diverse, needs some informality to balance it, so it couldn't be too rigid. Other cases like Bosnia probably um, spell out the other extreme when it's something formal is too rigid. Um, but some entirely informal mechanism of dealing with different regional interests clearly can also break down and can break down surprisingly fast, as Ukraine has shown us. So if I do have one lesson, it's really one about decentralization and, and federalization. And um, I've argued this for many years and I've often been criticized and, and have, I'm also probably now being going to be criticized by you for this. But let's drop perhaps the word federalism, oops, because it's so tainted in particular with regard to um, the uh, socialist uh, federations that collapsed. But if we think seriously about decentralization, so it shouldn't depend on the label, and decentralization not only to the local level, but actually a regional tier of um, uh, elected um, politicians, then that, I think, could have strengthened Ukrainian state before all of this happened. It possibly could have, these are obviously speculations, um, it could have taken um, some of the, the wind out of Russia's sails during the crisis. Um, and I think going forward can also um, strengthen the Ukrainian state. So it could actually be an impetus from all of this to, to in internally recreate and, and, and create a stronger, a stronger basis for this. There is not only in the former Soviet uh, Union, but also in the West, um, in particular since the 90s, great skepticism about federalism, and as it's often called ethno-federalism, as if it always breeds instability. It has risks attached to it, but as we now see, um, uh, there are risks without these arrangements too. So um, uh, it maybe its, its potential ahead of a conflict um, uh, deserves to be uh, re-evaluated because once the conflict has been taken in place, often we think immediately of various autonomy arrangements and and um, um, some some form of decentralization. So far, and and in this current context, it makes it hard for someone like Poroshenko to seriously think about decentralization because Russia thinks it's a good idea, therefore it has to be a bad idea. But that I think, in the, in, if we look closely at the at the Ukrainian state, is not the conclusion we should we should draw. So, so far. I can't see <coughs> serious attempts to move in that direction. Initial ideas were um, uh, sending kind of regional envoys of the president to the regions, but that's not what I was talking about, about regional elections of, of uh, a tier of, of politicians. Or a temporary arrangement for a three-year arrangement for as yet unspecified parts of Donetsk and Luhansk, a law that has now been called back. But that seems like damage control. That doesn't seem that's a very defensive move rather than a more serious, um, proactive move to try and institutionalize what's there already anyway. So if I if I um, kind of take any, any lesson in addition to a discussion we still have to have on also Western involvement in the build-up and uh, the conduct of this, of this war, then I think it's that both from outside, more could be done to uh, encourage uh, Ukraine to, to think more seriously about decentralization. And also internally, I see the election result, in particular um, the result Samuel Pomich got, as an internal um, uh, factor that could point in that direction. And I leave it here. Okay. Thank you, Gwen. Well, thanks for thanks for inviting me. It's it's uh, great to be here and see so many friends and colleagues I've known for a long time. Um, I, I'm going to 
do something really maybe crazy, which is to try to look forward. Um, and I think when, when you know, Lucan was talking about interviewing people on the Maidan, Lucan and I were running around the Maidan last, last November trying to ask these questions about why, why the lights are on and why they're able to haul trash in and, or ha trash out and firewood in and who's really running this. Um, we had no idea, right, what was to come in, in, the, in the next few months. So, so trying to look forward here is maybe um, just a bad idea, but I'm going to do it nonetheless. Um, try to lay out what the poss possible uh, paths are looking forward in terms of where does this conflict go, uh, this, this mixture of an international and a, and a civil war that we now have, and try to uh, identify some of the possible sources of uncertainty. There, there's a range of, of you know, potential, I don't want to call them outcomes because it's, uh, I don't want to say there's going to be any final ending to this, but range, ranging from peace, some sort of resolution of the conflict and an establishment of either, or either reestablishment of old borders um, or establishment of new borders that everybody regards as legitimate and uh, decides they're not going to fight about. Uh, th we may have a, a so-called frozen conflict. We may have what we have now, an unfrozen conflict, um, or we may have uh, an, an all-out war. Um, and so let me talk a little bit about w how I see those different possibilities. Um, so uh, right now, I would say where we stand, and of course it changes by the hour. We have to sort of see what's happened with the latest batch of, uh, of uh, artillery convoys we've, uh, we hear read reports about. Um, but it, essentially, we have, a, we have a low level on and off again war, um, an, an unfrozen conflict. Um, and in some sense, this is the default. This is what you get in that if, if nothing changes. It requires the least change from the current state of affairs. It also requires the least amount of coordination among the, the various actors. And in contrast to a frozen conflict, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, this unfrozen conflict does not require that Moscow and Kiev be able to control their local surrogates, right? And in fact, one of the things that can turn a frozen conflict into an into an unfrozen one, is that the local surrogates can go do things that the people who uh, ostensibly uh, are, are their puppeteers uh, don't anticipate or don't direct them to do. So it's easy to imagine an ongoing conflict fought largely uh, in a mix of conventional and, and unconventional form with a shifting front boiling up when somebody sees the opportunity to, to seize some territory or to achieve some, some goal and then settling down again. And you can see examples like this, uh, unfortunately, around the world these days. This kind of conflict creates huge problems for Ukraine, given all the other things it needs to do. Um, it creates smaller problems for Russia. Um, and that's true, actually, of most of these options. Um, and that might be a, Russia, uh, a reason for Russia to pursue it, is it would make that kind of conflict makes it impossible or, or, or very difficult for Ukraine to get on with things like uh, uh, thinking about how it wants to organize its politics, thinking about uh, um, constitutional changes, uh, trying to deal with the economy, and trying to build uh, or rebuild a functioning state. Um, sort of uh, moving, moving on, the, on the spectrum towards something slightly more peaceful, um, you, can get, you can get the frozen conflict. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people see that as the most optimistic scenario right now, in, in which both sides accept that they, uh, that they cannot change the status quo, or at least can't do it at a, at a price uh, that they're willing to pay. And, and there are precedents, of course, around the region, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, although Nagorno-Karabakh seems a little bit less frozen these days as well, and people are shooting down helicopters. But, but um, nonetheless, th these are things that, that, as those examples show, can persist a long time and do potentially allow the states involved to, to get on with their business. Um, I, I think there are some reasons why it may be hard to freeze this conflict or harder to freeze this conflict than those. Um, one is the absence of an obvious new border. In those other cases, there were internal borders that became internationalized in some way. Um, in many cases, uh, regional borders that exi had existed since Soviet times. Um, there's no intuitively obvious place um, until you get a lot further than they've gotten, right, uh, into the oblast borders to draw, to draw lines in this case. You, you'd have to, the, the Russian forces would have to gather up a lot of territory before that happened. Nor are there um, a lot of geographical obstacles to really build the defense around uh, th that could really make it easy uh, to defend a particular chunk of territory. And so whether conflict uh, can be frozen then will depend on, on probably at least three things. One of which is the, the intentions of the actors in, in Kiev and Moscow. Um, the other is their control over local actors. There's some speculation. Uh, I mean, I, th I think there's a sense that Russia has a lot of control, uh, but not total control over uh, uh, the, the pro-Russian forces. Uh, it's not entirely clear how much the government in Kiev has control over, over some of the, the actors uh, on that side. And in some cases, uh, the best fighting forces may be the ones that they control the least. Um, the other one is, is uh, the, the 
third factor that'll determine whether this can work or not is what I would just describe as kind of the, what, what turns out, and we won't know it till it happens, the state of military technology and tactics, right? What turns out to be the relative ease of defending or seizing territory? Do we get something at one extreme that ends up looking like the Western Front in World War I where everybody thought the offense was gonna be easy and it turned out that once you had some land you could dig in and defend it very easily? Or are you gonna get something that looks more like the, the, uh, e either the Eastern or Western Front in World War II, in which case uh, the offense was dominant, uh, 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 tanks could, could fairly easily uh, outmaneuver fixed defenses and so on. And it, it's, it's very hard to predict those things at, at, in advance as those examples show. It's possible, however, um, that we'll see an, an escalation to a full-blown war. Um, one way that that might happen is that Ukraine would, would marshal up enough force uh, to try to retake the lost territory. Um, I, I think if that happens, as we, as we saw um, in the late summer, if Ukraine gets, gets, uh, starts making some significant advances, Russia will, will put more, uh, more resources on the table uh, and, and respond in a large scale. And I think the certainty that that would happen uh, makes me think that the Ukrainian government is probably unlikely to go that route. I actually think the more likely route for this to escalate to a full-blown war is that Russia decides uh, to, to go a lot further than it already has, uh, minimally to build a land corridor uh, to Crimea, maximally to go all the way uh, across uh, uh, southern Ukraine to, uh, to Transnistria, to consolidate the so-called Novorossiya, uh, take Odessa, cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea. That would, that would be something. Um, if you could pull that off. And, and of course, put the European Union in a really um, difficult spot. Um, if I put myself in, in, in Russia's shoes and in Mr. Putin's shoes, and, and um, it's probably a bad, a bad thing to, to do, um, it seems to me that, that at a minimum, you've got you've to take this opportunity to seize a land corridor to Crimea. This talk about building a bridge or something else seems a little bit crazy. This is a much cheaper way to get the job done. Um, it solves a major problem, it's military achievable, and it probably doesn't incur too many more international costs than the ones you've already incurred. That being said, the fact of the matter is we don't have too much idea of, uh, of, of Putin's thinking on this, and of course that's the great um, uncertainty here. All the way to the other end of the spectrum is, is actual peace. Um, some legitimation of borders, and for that to happen, there has to be a widespread acceptance uh, on, on not only on both sides in governments, but on the local actors, of, of some status quo, either an old status quo, um, the, the, the borders that existed last year at this time, um, or some new status quo, a, a new division of territory and establishment of who's going to be sovereign over it. It's hard to imagine, that, as I said already, that Russia's gonna let this territory be reintegrated um, into Ukraine, or that the local pro-Russian forces um, would acquiesce. Uh, the more interesting question is, is uh, whether Ukraine can somehow come to accept the loss of this territory uh, endorse the new borders and move on. There are a lot of obstacles to doing that. It would be very painful to Ukraine, to most of us inside and outside of Ukraine. It would seem just plain wrong. It would seem to reward aggression. I think politically it, it would be potentially suicidal for, for the Ukrainian leaders that tried to do that. And you might feel that if you were to endorse that bit of, uh, of aggression that it would only encourage uh, further separatism or further ru Russian intervention. But it's probably the only solution that would actually allow Ukraine to try to cons consolidate its hold over its remaining territory and to get on with the issue um, that, that, it, that it faces. So if I can try to rival um, Lukin in, in being provocative and in vying for your booze, I would say that I think if the Ukrainian government were really clever, um, they would say, okay, we've decided to recognize this, this so-called referendum uh, that you had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you can have it, Russia. Territory's yours. Um, we're moving on. Um, I think you would... Uh, I, I actually think Russia would probably reject that, but nonetheless, um, th something has to happen um, if Ukraine's to be able to deal with any of its other problems, which is precisely why I think Russia would find a way to sabotage uh, even that concession. Um, I think for Russia, that option is probably less desirable um, than any of the others, but that again is based on my reading, fairly cynical reading of, of Russia's goals. So lastly, um, let me just say something about the sources of un uncertainty and how this is all gonna work out. The biggest source of uncertainty is, is Putin's intentions, right? Russia holds most of the cards here. And, and ultimately, the, the way this goes is gonna determine a lot on the choices uh, that Mr. Putin makes, and we just don't know. Another big variable is the coherence of the Ukrainian state. Um, that is not only sort of a variable in and of itself, but it's something that, that Russia appears um, consciously to be trying to uh, manipulate. A third one then also is, as I already mentioned, this, this sort of offense-defense balance on the ground. War is famously difficult to predict, and how this actually goes uh, could, could, uh, could determine um, a lot.
So, so to conclude, um, a peaceful path forward is possible, um, but I think it's not very likely. Um, probably my best guess is that something looking like a frozen conflict is, is most uh, likely. Um, I don't really see any possibility of establish, reestablishing the status quo ante, and I'm skeptical that the Ukrainian government would find the, the vision or the political strength to, to, uh, to actually just say, we're going to give you the territory and move on. Um, and lastly, I think Putin has, has a considerable uh, amount to gain by reigniting the conflict or, or keeping it going. Um, not only territorial gains, but again, uh, putting pressure on the Western alliance. And that's one of the great unknowns about his motivations. Is this just about Ukraine, or is he really trying to do something much broader? And we, and we just don't know. So, so uh, with that, let me, uh, let me close, and uh, I think we'll have some discussion. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, as you see, we covered a lot of territory already. Uh, and there is uh, 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 a number of questions uh, which we could raise. But I see also very interesting uh, uh, disagreements uh, uh, emerging uh, between, between you and, and especially between Lucan and, and Gwyn. And I would like to zero in on, on, on two of those. Uh, now, it, it seems to me that, uh, that Lucan suggested that uh, conflict w within Ukraine open the opportunities for, for Putin to move in. But Gwyn seems to suggest that there is something about unintended consequences of EU policies uh, which sort of provoke uh, uh, that kind of response by Russia. And there are some people, of course, uh, uh, as uh, our colleague, Professor Waltz, uh, who, who argue that these were misguided, intended policies of NATO and, and the West, which, which really sort of provoked uh, uh, Russia to, to do what they did. Now, I wonder what you think about this and whether this, is, this, is, this disagreement uh, 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 is, uh, is the right one or, or we have the combination and so on. And the second one question which I wanted to, to, to pose to you at this point is that uh, there is disagreement about the state capacity of, of Ukraine before the conflict. Right. I think, again, Lukan seems to suggest that, that this was a, a kind of failed uh, authoritarian regime, really not able to control the territory and, and respond in coercive way to, to challenges and so on. And, and I think uh, Gwen is more cautious on, uh, on that, pointing to some uh, uh, you know, elements of the state building which, uh, which one could have judged as, as more successful. So. Uh, could I ask you to, to respond to maybe to the first issue of, of EU uh, um, and intended sort of consequences of EU policies or, or intended uh, misguided policies of the West vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, just simple opportunity which created uh, uh, itself by, by the crisis of uh, uh, which happened. So maybe Gwen, you could. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Um. Yes, maybe I should cl clarify what I meant by this, that the EU is in the West generally, but the EU in particular is, is, is part of this build-up. And uh, I don't mean to say that this is the only or the main factor. I think I would also see, um, perhaps slightly differently from Luca, but I would also see the main main, main reasons are within Ukraine and then in, in the relationship with, with Russia. Um, but I think the fact that the EU um, thinks um, in particular templates and vis-a-vis -vis Eastern Europe, that's the template of enlargement, even though they, they have said all along, um, well, either they've said the, the door isn't closed and it isn't open <laughs> either somehow, um, so that they've stayed um, vague on Ukraine um, is understandable from kind of how inside the EU, how the process works. But then relations with a country like, like the EU are nevertheless channeled through the template that in other cases has led to membership. So this can only have one effect, namely that the Ukrainian population and also political elites um, over time think that that's the path. And so if we think that the actual trigger for the Euromaidan um, protests is actually an unusual one, that when has a foreign policy issue become a trigger of mass protest. Um, so the non-signing of the association agreement was the trigger. That's a, that's a <coughs> bizarre trigger for a protest uh, in the bigger scheme of, of protests. But of course behind it is a, it stood for the EU doesn't stand only for kind of a complex set of institutions in Brussels, but for aspirations for a better living standard, uh, for, for more accountability, for a less corrupt regime. And this is incidentally why also the Euromaidan isn't only a, a phenomenon of the center and of the West in Ukraine. I think we sometimes forget that there were also demonstrations um, 
in in the south and the east smaller but that's nevertheless really important to, to take uh, that into consideration and people also move to Kiev and so on to, to protest so I think it's in part of the unintended consequences are in in the EU's um, inflexibility to um, think about different types of relationships with countries that it has no intention of taking in anytime soon um, and ironically maybe kind of at the height already of the crisis and it was a bit ironic that it took, or very ironic that it took place in Minsk under Lukashenko's um, uh, kind of, he was the host, um, that you get meetings with different actors in the room, including um, representatives of the Eurasian Union and the EU. So maybe Ukraine is a country where earlier discussions about different options and not one or the other could have, I think, done, done, done something. But that wouldn't have taken away um, the, the, the um, growing um, Frustration inside Ukraine with the regime that Yanukovych's regime, as that kind of regime that we that we saw there. So that's that wasn't. Uh, um, he was as unpopular in the southeast as he was in in the center and in the west. So that might look now from with hindsight different again. But that I think is is is, is key. So a lot of other things came out with that, and then Russia's reaction came after an interim government really had been installed, and that's when the language of something illegitimate started taking off and so that's when the dynamics unfolded but that wasn't quite the starting point sorry that was a rather long answer to only parts of the question Luca? Um, so I don't think that Ukraine before the crisis would have been considered an especially weak state I mean you know if you use measures like does it pay its police and whatnot I mean by most standard measures I certainly didn't think of it as especially weak but what I think is remarkable is the degree to which the Yanukovych regime was unable to engage in basic acts of authoritarianism um, for example, censoring the media. I mean, one of the striking things about um, the media during those events is that they were much more um, uh, objective than they were during the Orange Revolution. I mean, the Adin Plus Adin, a major television station, um, you know, showed the crisis, you know, showed the, uh, the demonstrations, you know, in a quite positive light, which is quite remarkable, I think. You know, the, you know, the, I mean, it's quite remarkable. Yanukovych, who surely is not a big fan of uh, media freedom, was unable to control his own oligarch. Um, I think that's striking. Um, and I think it's also clear that the state truly broke down, truly became Kyrgyzstan, truly became Georgia in, in late February, early March. I mean, that's just objectively the case. You know, police disappeared from the streets. Um, there was, you know, little means of uh, imposing law and order. So I, you know, and I think it's quite remarkable how quickly that happened. And I think that's impor very important to understanding, you know, why it is that you have the outcome you have. So I'm not sure that, you know, before the crisis it was especially weak but clearly was unable to meet the challenge of, of large-scale protests. So. Paul, what do you think about, uh, was Putin uh, provoked or uh, was he an, an opportunist? Uh. Um, I, I tend to go with the, uh, the opportunist view um, briefly. I, I mean, I think U.S. policy in particular, but also EU, po EU policy, has been, let's say, tone deaf um, regarding Russia's concerns for probably 20 years now. At the same time, that I mean, it's been tone deaf regarding pretty much everybody, and, and this is not the kind of result um, that you necessarily see. The Putin government um, has made it a sort of a core of its of its strategy for building its domestic legitimacy um, to be anti-Western, and, and that's not that decision is not something I think you can blame on the West. Um, so there's not only opportunism in terms of internationally, we're going to. Uh, take the opportunity presented by, by this revolution to, to take Crimea and so on, but opportunism domestically to say uh, the economy, you know, has been up and down. Um, you know, there were protests against Putin, let's remember, a few years ago, um, and this stuff sells, um, like it does in most countries, like it does in this country. Um, successful military uh, actions sell really well. And so in that sense, I think it's, um, it's opportunistic. Mm -hmm. Let me open the floor. Uh, if you could just quickly introduce yourself uh, before asking the question, and um, and if you could keep, you know, the comments to the minimum, so so uh, we all can participate. Uh, Tony, please. Uh, thank you, Tony Jones, Northeastern University. Let me firstly thank the panel for raising. Uh, questions which we'll be debating and writing about at least for the next 10 or 20 years. I see lots of dissertations coming out of this crisis, so in that sense, it's, it's good. Let me push it a little bit further, though, uh, beyond even Paul's position. Opportunism um, can be seen in, in Margaret Thatcher's use of the Falklands. Uh, 
it was it came at the right time. Her, her popularity was low. Uh, victory in the Falklands boosted it. That is not, I think, the case with Russia and Putin. My sense of this is that this is part of a very long strategy which has been in the works for a very long time. I suspect that the people who were the little green men have been in place for a very long time and that the strategy has been there. The timing, I think, was brought about by, by the Maidan events, but I think that this, this really just provided the opportunity for goals which were already in place. And let me connect it to military, which I haven't heard anyone mention yet. Russia, as everybody knows, has always had a problem with the naval presence of Russia around the world. Um, in the last few years, the Crimea, which is its main Black Sea base, has been in Ukraine. No problem there. They've, they've managed to, uh, to arrange a, a, a co um, an agreement with Ukraine. However, in the event that Ukraine went into the EU and into NATO, it would be very difficult for Russia to secure its naval bases in Crimea. Secondly, the events in the Middle East, particularly Syria, have <coughs> put into doubt <coughs> Russia's naval bases there. So if Ukraine went to the west, and if Syria were to go in yet another direction, Russia would be left without any Black Sea fleet. There would be nowhere to put it. Now, maybe this is part of it. So what we're seeing perhaps, and I don't know any more than anyone else does, but what we're seeing perhaps is a military issue which is being solved through these kinds of events where you stir up trouble, you keep the conflict on the boil, you keep NATO uh, confused, you keep the Europeans at bay, and meanwhile you have got something that you could not possibly have bought. There's no money that could have bought you, you uh, Crimea. They have it. It's a fait accompli. What do you think of that? Uh, if the members of the panel feel compelled to respond immediately, please do. Uh, if, uh, but we can also collect a few more questions and then, right? So maybe, maybe, yeah? yeah? Okay. It's pretty sad. Thank you very much. Uh, Oleg Kotsuba, a PhD student in Slavic department and journal Kritika. Um, I was wondering about uh, uh, Luke and Wei's view on the role of the Russian propaganda in um, establishing a certain view uh, about the events on Euromaidan in the eastern uh, part of Ukraine. Because you refer a lot to the symbols, right? something that can be easily televised, but you say very little about the uh, informational war that Russia started playing very early on in the uh, in this in this event. Um, and the second question is about um, the interests that we all acknowledge. So we, we do acknowledge uh, the Russian interest here a lot, and we say how you know a lot of countries, the West, has been ignoring them. But we say very little about the Ukrainian interests and about the not so much Ukraine as a state even but of the Ukrainian people, and they voice it very clearly on, you know, on the Euromaidan and dying and so on. Um, what is your view on that? Thank you. Let me have one more question from Serhi, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, we hear a lot that what is happening in Ukraine is also a major threat to international order in general in, in, in Europe. And I know that it is difficult, almost impossible, to um, make any forecast or predict what will happen in Ukraine, but maybe it's easier to predict what can happen with the international order now. So the, the 1994 agreement on the uh, uh, sovereignty of Ukraine in exchange for, for nuclear arms is, of course, gone in smoke. and. Uh, uh, generally for the first time since World War II we see the use of minorities to uh, take over territories. So I would love to hear what you think about the future of international order in general and in Europe in particular. Thank you. So, so we have one specific question to Lucan and, uh, and then two more general questions. So maybe we we'll start with you, Lucan. Okay. First of all, I want to respond to the question of, um, of before about, you know, it was this all part of a grand plan, which I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable, you know, believing that um, Putin had this plan. But I think the question is always, um, what costs are you willing to incur to fulfill this plan? <laughs> and that's the big question. And, th and that's why there are a lot of plans that are just never realized. And so I'm guessing that this was one of those plans that sort of, and that, uh, that's what I mean by opportunity, that not that he but didn't have some vision, 
but there are a lot of visions we never fulfill. Um, and that's what I think. So we do have to, in that sense, we have to look at opportunity. The Russian propaganda. I, I'm, ha I'm willing to believe that that played an important role. I don't know. I haven't seen a study of it. I, mean, I do know that um, well, there are two issues. That One, you know, media um, only has an effect when people are primed to believe it in the first place. And then, in fact, studies of, you know, there have been a lot of studies in the West of, of trying to show the impact of media. But the problem is that viewership tends to be self-selecting. So the people who watch Fox News are already totally, totally right-wing anyway. So it's actually hard to show the impact of Fox News, right? And so, um, and so it's hard to believe, you know, so I'm imagining that this is, this is the same case here, that you already had people, if they're watching Russian television all the time, they're probably already pretty pro-Russian to begin with. Um, Um, yes, let me pick up on a few points as well. Um, uh, again, ultimately, we don't know is a big strategy or not, and, and, and maybe that's not even all that important. I mean, if, even if there are parts of kind of scenarios that then could be acted upon quickly, then the result might be might be the same. I think in what you say, th there are um, military issues um, are part <coughs> of the discussion. There's no <coughs> doubt about this. Um, and I think you put your finger on it already when you when you when you named EU and NATO in in one. So I think this, uh, which is another uh, unfortunate thing, that the EU and EU enlargement and NATO enlargement sort of have become conflated through the whole process in which it was conducted in Central and Eastern Europe. And and so the whole idea of the Euro-Atlantic integration in, in Ukraine, what does that term even mean? It means both together. And clearly, NATO has been. Uh, more of the problem than the EU until now. Now the EU seems to be a problem from Russia's perspective as well. But so I think NATO and, uh, is, is an important part um, in this. Um, linking this to sort of Saeed's question in terms of um, the international order and international law, and maybe that is the actual strategy rather than something precise and military. Uh, the strategy seems to be to, to show that the international order, how the West envisaged it and thought it had already established it, is, is not how, how international politics is conducted. And this seems to be now Russia, both domestically and externally, has been in a position to, to show that. Um, and it, it really shows that um, inter an international order doesn't exist. Uh, international law is, um, is, uh, can be pretty meaningless. I mean, the West had bent it before as well. But um, now we're, we're, we can clearly not say that international law is going to, to stop um, anything from happening. Um, so I think we're in a much messier world where we all acknowledge now this is not the framework in which politics unfold and uh, um, uh, situations arise where maybe also somewhat differently from before uh, there's a conflict with Russia over um, or between the West and, and Russia over Ukraine, perhaps. But at the same time, uh, interactions with Russia continue about other international issues. So that's probably more the international um, order we're in now, that uh, it's very issue dependent and uh, strange combinations of um, kind of policies and, and alliances are, are possible. In terms of the, the other point about Ukrainian, you know, which should take Ukrainian interests or what are the Ukrainian interests that were expressed in the Euromaidan, I think that to keep that, I mean, to keep that focus of what, what people actually wanted and what they protested against, namely a particular kind of a political regime and aspirations to have at least better living standards, if not kind of EU, EU, EU membership. I think that that means, and also together with that information war question, I think the Russian propaganda, uh, that information war seemed to work and was probably mainly directed at Russia itself and the domestic public in, in Russia. Because as I was saying, with these election results in the regions, it seems to show it's, it hasn't really worked in, in, in the Southeast, or only <coughs> partly. And, and so I think that really means also something about what what people now want. I mean, they don't seem to want uh, partitioning of the country or um, these kinds of things. So I think um, putting the two together actually probably it hasn't worked as well as one might have might have thought. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, let me just say a couple things um, quickly. W one is about this question about U Ukrainian interests. Well, there's a lot of different Ukrainian people in a lot of different groups, and one of the interests it's not exactly what you asked about. But one of the interesting questions going forward is how do some of these groups behave, especially the ones that have armed themselves, um, the ones that showed that they could take over central Kiev, or the ones that showed that they could go fight the Russian army. Um, do some of those groups, at some point, as some of them have said they're going to do, head to Kiev if they don't, you know? And I start thinking about sort of, you know, 1918, 1919, where all kinds of interesting things happen. Um, and and, and um, 
so that gets back to the sort of the, the state building question. Um, there's a lot of force in Ukraine. Is there is there a monopoly on force in Ukraine? No. Is there a monopoly on legitimate force? I mean, and so on. I don't think so. Sergei, to, to your question, um, again, trying to expand a bit, um, so is this a, a threat to the international order? It is. I think what's equally interesting is, is it intended to be a threat to the international order? And increasingly, I think the answer is yes. And if you look at the rhetoric coming out of Russia just in the last few weeks, um, if you anybody who hasn't read the text of Putin's speech at Valdai or this um, address to history teachers at the, at the, what is it, the Institute of Contemporary History, you should read it because it is chilling. Um, it is scary stuff. And, it, and um, some of the stuff that Karaganov is saying now, it goes beyond the we don't like what the Americans are doing, we don't like what the Europeans are doing, to saying that order is dead, making empirical statements. That order is dead, and now we're going to do something different. Um, and I, I uh, so I think it's both intended to create that, but it's intended to really say we're going to now uh, get the bit between our teeth and we're going to start uh, changing the rules. And, and not, just, not just breaking down existing rules, but we're going to start doing things differently. Okay, back. Please, Nadia. Thank you. Nadia Kravitz, postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and the Davis Center. Uh, question, um, one specific to Gwen, um, on the EU. And what, in your view, um, could EU have done differently in Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis, um, Russia's securitization of, uh, of Ukraine's membership perspective? Um, and also, if you could maybe think about what the effect of this crisis has had on EU itself and whether membership is now more likely or less likely for Ukraine. So, uh, um, on, on, on that subject. And then, a question on sanctions for all of you. Um, sanctions vis-a-vis -vis EU, but also um, the West in general. What is your view in terms of the effectiveness of it as a tool? Um, whether that should be kept on um, and increased as it's looking more likely? Um, or was this completely a, a dubious strategy and should have been abandoned early on. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Irvesh Shalat. I'm a student over at the Business School. Um, so I have two questions, one specifically for you, Gwen, and one for the panel at large. Um, Gwen, specifically for you, my question is, uh, so you talked about decentralization. And how would that work when one of the most contentious issues between the regions is effectively customs policy or foreign policy? Uh, in almost every instance of federalism, those are the two things that the federal government almost necessarily holds. So how does that decentralization work, or how could it have worked in a way that could have sort of eased the way that this situation went? And my question for the larger group is, there's a narrative of uh, these protests being pro-democracy. Um, were those, or to what extent were those also anti-oligarch? And how should we think about the fact that many of these people are still on the scene, including people having been put into positions of power? I'm thinking of um, Tartua uh, as governor of Donetsk um, and uh, Kolomoisky uh, in the, I can't pronounce this place, but uh, Dnipro, uh, Petrov, there we go, there. Um, and, and, and what role has uh, that group of individuals had on the course of events? And, and again, w why do you think they're still sort of hanging around? Have they been put there strategically because of their money and power and sort of ability to get things done? Uh, or is there something else going on here? So these were two very loaded questions and, uh, and, and broad win. Maybe you could start. Okay, there's quite a lot there. Um, first on Nadia's questions about the EU. Maybe one should also say it's, it's easy to bash the EU, um, and, and, and I, I have clearly done this here, but it was also never meant to kind of um, sort out a country like Ukraine, and it sort of reluctantly gets into this position, and it, however, probably then makes mistakes along the way. So it's to, um, um, to kind of put that in perspective. Um, it probably should have done a number of things and could still do them now going forward, um, which are partly to do with the EU as it stands currently, not only vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine or what it does in Ukraine, things like energy di diversification, so things like um, um, that have will have an impact on, on Ukraine but also on, on the EU. Um, in terms of the association agreement, I think an obvious thing to, uh, in my view, to not do um, was uh, already in the midst of a crisis to still push ahead with the association agreement. You could see that for political reasons, for symbolic reasons, um, that um, seemed to be a good thing to do. But when something kind of 
get stuck and then to say, okay, now we do it anyway, we split the agreement, go ahead with one part and the next bit you get later, seems like a reaction, okay, now now we nevertheless do it and it's already obviously somehow not working or part of a, of a broader conflict dynamic. And then rat sort of signing or ratifying the whole thing and now postponing its implementation for a year seems to be just about the worst outcome. So somehow this idea, this piecemeal sort of trying to find a solution and probably either putting it on hold altogether uh, would have been the thing to do now, it seems it's it's much more open to other influences like Russia having basically blocked the implementation now. So I think that's uh, probably the EU has, in this case, ended up in the worst possible position and through this sort of piecemeal approach. Um, in terms of membership, I think it's as unlikely now as it was uh, before. Um, and uh, I, I didn't mean to say that the EU had to promise <coughs> EU membership beforehand because I think the EU in its current state, um, it's not even clear how the EU, what the EU will look like. Um, it, it's, this is not a time when it can do this, but by not making this clear early on, um, I think it again embarked on this path which brought out problems. And in an ideal world, I think Ukraine would have been a country where that gets taken seriously by the EU, which of course it for a long time didn't because it was outside the borders and the EU is always busy with, with things closer by. Um, and to really seriously think of, of other ways of engaging. I mean, the EU has also relationships um, and close ones, um, economic ones, political ones, with other countries much further afield to kind of think of a, of a different way of engaging rather than squeezing it through this path towards membership, which clearly there's no consensus inside the EU to do this, and there will not be, and will not, not be now. Um, on uh, the point about uh, decentralization and, and federalization, um, well, there are obviously different ways of doing it, and, and if one went the whole way and said you can also have your own foreign policy, then clearly that's, a, that's, a, that's probably a, a confederation, if nothing else. But what I was talking about was a more modest um, model where, where kind of ultimately those powers remain at the, at the national level. Um, I, I don't actually think that, um, and I don't know where the evidence would be to say that um, southern, southern and eastern regions uh, if we mean by foreign policy, you wanted to split away or form a unit with, with the Russian Federation. I think it's often more put through, um, for example, economic links. Um, so then I think, again, it's not a matter of kind of does a country align with one or the other or join one organization or another, but actually um, uh, keeping economic relations, business relations uh, that are different in the West from the, from the East. Um, also, um, that links it with the oligarch question, the oligarchs are not one coherent group. Um, so many of the, um, or at least a considerable number of oligarchs from the southern and eastern regions were not opposed to closer <coughs> links with the EU because they realized they, they have to adjust and actually maybe stand also to benefit in, in some ways. So I think also that, that they would only all look in one direction in foreign policy terms, I don't think that holds. So I think uh, um, a more decentralized system would um, would first of all clarify some of those positions and then probably be able to, to channel or could be possible to channel them through um, in the Ukrainian state differently. Um, on the oligarchs, maybe just as addition, one could say that decentralization could also clearly entrench oligarchy interests. So that would be one of the um, very likely outcomes. But they are also already entrenched anyway. So in a way, one could say, well, we could might as well try institutionally something else where perhaps um, uh, a reaction, as we saw against the Yanukovych regime, uh, could then be, be channeled that they hold um, regional um, politicians accountable through through elections. Um, so in that sense, it could could perhaps do that, and they will have to be involved in going forward. I mean, it's not a not a nice um, kind of choice to to leave out certain actors out of um, kind of reforming the state or. Um, uh, finding some sort of solution to the crisis, they, they will have to be involved. But they're not one coherent group. Um, that's very obvious. Mm -hmm. Paul? Well, there's a bunch of interesting questions there. Let me just take one um, for the sake of time, which is uh, sanctions, which, which you asked about, um, Nadia. Uh, I think we have to be, be clear about what sanctions do and what they, what they don't do. Um, I think the, the European Union felt that it had to do something, and I agree, it had to do something. And it wasn't going to arm Ukrainians or a lot of other things. So what you're left with is sanctions. Um, symbolically, it's incredibly important to, to uh, you know, because talk is cheap, and so you have to do something that costs. And sanctions cost the Europeans as well as the Russians. And they say, they set a clear marker to say th th that we're willing to endure some cost to protest this. And I think that's important. Um, in terms of uh, a signaling Russia that you know, other things may happen if it goes further. But 
I don't think there should be any illusion um, that it's actually going to change Russia's behavior. And I think, in fact, it's likely to lead to more of the behavior that you're trying to stop. And the reason I think that is, is twofold. One is, on a symbolic region, this clearly outrages uh, the Russian government and Putin in particular. And, and I think um, he makes it more determined um, to get through this um, uh, his way um, to prove to the Europeans that, that, um, that you cannot dictate to Russia. Um, I th so I think it steals his resolve rather than the opposite. Uh, moreover, um, to the extent that, that Putin um, still has to worry about his legitimacy, um, it rests on a couple of things. It rests on economic performance and it rests on foreign policy success um, and anti-Westernism. To the extent that sanctions and falling, oil pr falling global oil prices undermine Russia's economy, he actually will have to shift more towards the foreign policy side to, to generate his legitimacy, which likely would make him uh, m need more foreign policy successes rather than fewer, and, and I think would push him in the direction of greater aggression. Does that mean it's a bad policy? Not necessarily, because again, there's this symbolic dimension. Um, but it's a tough one. Yeah, so I just want to, um, about the sanctions. I think, uh, first of all, I think it's actually hard to know sometimes whether sanctions work in the sense that um, oftentimes sanctions have a very contingent impact. So, for example, there were a lot of sanctions in, in Ukraine during the crisis that turned out to have worked because I think they discouraged people from following Yanukovych when things got really bad. In other words, I think the isolation of Yanukovych. So I think it's, um, you know, it may not sort of um, affect the sort of short-term policy change, but I think it can sort of weaken the loyalty of those surrounding um, the autocrat. And so that by itself is not necessarily going to uh, change things, but at the same time, you know, may, given other um, sources of crisis, may have an impact. Although at the same time, I think there is a side to it in which, um, you know, part of this, you know, sanctions help Putin because he wants to keep money in Russia. So that kind of can, you know, so I'm a pro sort of of two minds there. That second point is important. What about federalism? What do you think about that issue? Um, so I think, you know, I, I think the issue that you raise is actually very important. That, that um, part of the problem is that the, the the hot button issue that people really care about is foreign policy, that you can't, right? And um, and it's more of a kind of, and I think you, at some level Gwen's right that you know, you can sort of nonetheless have you know trade and whatnot, but it's a really symbolic issue, that is, you know, that if you give to local regions, you basically destroy Ukraine. So that is the rub, right? And I'm not sure that sort of, you know. Anything short of that is really going to matter to people in the East at this point. So, if, I mean, I've been saying for, I don't know, at least 10 years, I think, that Ukraine should have a federal system. And, and I've always argued it not based on, on this matter, but based on democracy and autocracy within Ukraine, which is, you know, Henry Hale's written about these patronal pyramids. And, and my argument has always been when you get real autocracies, when you have a single patronal pyramid, and if Ukraine were, were a federal system, you might have 15 uh, regional pyramids, but they would keep each other in check at the national level and you would be hard to get the kind of government that you've got with, with Yanukovych. Um, as far as, but, but I do think it's a problem. There's always been this perception, right? We saw how the Soviet Union fell apart. It fell apart along federal lines, and we don't want that to happen in Ukraine. At some point, if you assume that any federal structure is going to immediately lead to secession, I guess I have to ask the question as to whether the, the states can be able to hold together in any event. Um, you know. Yeah, no, it's because I, I don't think uh, foreign policy is the, is the key issue on, on most Ukrainians' mind. And of course, we're sitting here speculating, but I think the economy, social and economic issues are. Right. And at the moment, uh, but also probably uh, through the way in which survey questions are asked, if it's only about, do you want to be in NATO, in NATO or not? Right. Do you want EU membership? What do you think of uniting with Russia or not? But w that, that, that sort of impression exists that that's the key thing. If you ask people what they really worry about, in addition to having been displaced and huge humanitarian issues at the moment, I think are social and economic issues. And I think their uh, political mechanisms and economic reforms can address some of that. And then some of the rhetoric around foreign policy choices um, go away. Can, can I also just point out that the, the leading, the people who are, who are you know, leading the, the uh, what is it called, the Donetsk People's Republic, are not the leading oligarchs of the Donbass. Right? Those people were much better off being oligarchs in Donetsk in Ukraine, because then they don't have to take on Putin in in his whole game. Um, the people who are pushing this now are people who are disempowered in Ukraine and therefore you know, don't have any, they have no stake in the current system. And therefore, they might be able to go to Russia, get, get some share of the swag. Um, but had there been a federal policy in place before this crisis, my guess is there would have been much less incentive to do this sort of stuff. Could I keep the issue of oligarch uh, alive for a moment? Um, 
is it enough to say that we have different oligarchs in Ukraine? Some are on that side, others are on, on the other side? Which is other that, side? Well. The dark side? Right. <laughs> right. So, so how, how divided are they? And, and whether you can really see interest aligning you know, with uh, the EU? Are they more interested in, in having relations with Europe, uh, which make you know, be not very wise position from the, their personal economic point of view, because it was much easier to make money, you know, when you dealt with Russians and, and so on. How, how that looks like, because that seems to be the sort of underlying element of, of many things which are going on, right? Taking sides and... and uh. I'll invoke the, I think, what is it, the Stoper Samuelson theory, which basically says people, you know, actors that are in sectors uh, that uh, that are do well locally, uh, don't want to be internationalized, and, and vice versa. And I think that's how the oligarchs are. I think some of them, that given the resources they control, are much better off, you know, sort of isolated from Western Europe because they don't want to have to compete. Others, and to some extent, uh, you know, Akhmetov increasingly was in this, saw more opportunity in being able to act in Western Europe than, than, than limitation in doing so. And so I think it divided along. These people are pragmatists. They're mostly <coughs> interested in their money. And I don't think any of them have any intrinsic loyalty to anything much more than, than that. Um, point I would have stressed as well, they're pragmatic and they will, I think, go where it suits their interests. Um, and it's, it's been obvious that they, they haven't been able to prevent anything from, from happening. Um, but clearly in trying to somehow rebuild um, even, even basic infrastructure, if not a, a functioning political and economic system, they will be important. Um, but I think that's the key point, they're pragmatists. But um, pragmatic oligarchs or, or business people don't want instability. So I think that's the bottom line. They, they, currently, they certainly don't want what, what's currently there. And in an ideal world, one would move beyond these entrenched interests, but that's not the world Ukraine is in at the moment. I, mean, I do think it's quite remarkable how weak Akhmetov turned out to be. I mean, you know, here I think, I mean, one of the reasons why I was always, you know, you know, felt fine about Ukrainian terrorist hold integrity because the economic interests had such a stake in Ukrainian independence. But it turns out that, you know, when the, go, you know, when the, the real moment of, 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 of crisis, Akhmetov, you know, whose interests clearly lie in an independent Ukraine, just seemed completely unable to do anything to save it. I mean, which I think is quite remarkable to sort of, the story of, of, of Akhmetov's sort of fall, I think is quite striking. At the same time, I mean, the other thing that's striking, of course, is looking at the new government and the extent to which, you know, this is an anti-oligarchic revolution and Poroshenko is the best you get? You know, I mean, really? That's all you can do? You know, and the notion, you know, in this sort of, I mean, you know, it, it turns out that actually corruption, we haven't talked about that yet, but corruption has gone down, but it's mainly because corruption was so awful under Yanukovych and so centralized. I mean, he basically centralized money laundering, right? I mean, he, everything you can name, you know, procurement. I mean, it's quite remarkable the extent to which he just monopolized it all. So if that's your baseline, it's going to look good almost regardless, right? So in that sense, you can be, it's sort of a, you know, what's the difference between a Russian optimist and a Russian pessimist? You know, Russian um, pessimist says it's so bad it can't get worse, and a Russian optimist says, yes, it can. Yes, it can. <laughs> uh, we have three questions in, in that, so. Uh, Lubomir Haidt, I'm the Associate Director at the Ukrainian Research Institute. Um, since we're at the Center for European Studies, I wonder whether we, I can shift the discussion a little bit in the uh, direction of Europe. And I have uh, two interrelated questions. Uh, the first is, uh, mostly we've been hearing from the panel in general terms about the European Union, Europe, but I don't think we've heard mention of individual countries even by name. So I'm wondering whether uh, you know, anybody would care to give an assessment of perhaps the differences in approaches uh, among some of the main actors in the European Union toward the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. Uh, I know we are aware of many of the differences, but perhaps there have been developments over the past few months that may indicate some kind of evolution that we may not be aware of and that we should be more alert to. And the second, uh, I think connected to it, is uh, what would be your assessment of the move right in a number of European countries in a pro-Russian direction. Some people have called it a pro-fascist direction. Uh, 
And what are the implications of that both for the Ukrainian-Russian conflict but also for the European Union uh, itself internally? Thank you. Louis Druka, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Thank you very much for uh, the fantastic presentations. I have two small points. The energy agreement signed uh, with strong support by the European Union, as Mario Barroso said uh, just before uh, finishing his term, end of October, uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Is that going to hold and is that going to uh, do what it is supposed to do, keep those EU member states warm who are involved in it. And the uh, next last point is uh, that Poroshenko is saying by two, uh, 2020 uh, to be in the union. Is that strategic or is that bad advice? Mm -hmm. And we had one more, I saw one more hand. Uh, yes. uh, cut to the geopolitical chase. Do you believe that there are or soon will be or eventually will be Russian nuclear weapons in Crimea? All right. So who would like to start? We have a bunch of questions. Mm, I can start with the last one. There will be Russian nukes in Crimea to the extent that Putin thinks it will make a big international splash and make us really cranky. Um, I, I, militarily, I think it's really irrelevant where you put your nuclear weapons. Um, you could, I mean, they've got missiles, can blast them all over the planet, but if he thinks there's some good nightly news in it, um, I, I think he'll do it. Um, the, the energy agreement, I would just say very quickly, um, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to go, but um, I, I, w I wouldn't bet a lot of money on that agreement uh, continuing to be honored. Um, I, I suspect Mr. Putin may let the Europeans find out whom they depend on and whom they don't. At the same time, he has said, and he's right about I mean, This is what's interesting about this, and the bigger picture is, um, this is where the Russians uh, and the European Union are bound together, which is the Russian needs the money to f flow that way, and the Europeans need the gas to flow that way. And they can't, in that sense, completely disengage even if they want to. And that's one of the things that makes this really interesting, which is how do you have a fight with somebody that you're that uh, interdependent with? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, also on the energy agreement. I mean, the agreement is already only until March next year anyway, so it's really only an agreement to get through the winter, both for Ukraine and the rest of the EU. Um, and basically, the, the gist of the agreement is that the EU and the IMF pay um, pay Ukraine's debt and, as a result, secure their own supply. So it's not a long-term um, long deal at all. Um, um, Poroshenko, talking about 2020, um, well, I think it's in line with what I said before, it's unrealistic, um, but maybe uh, the key issue is actually what will the EU look like in 2020, and it will not look like the EU today, and maybe countries will have left by then, and maybe different types of cooperations emerge, and Ukraine may very well be part of that. Um, it's clear why, why um, he, he is saying it at the moment, but um, I think it's not a, not a real target for, for anybody, probably not even inside Ukraine so much. Um, on the first question um, about EU foreign policy and countries in Europe, um, I think it's obvious that the EU has no foreign policy, really. I mean, the, the only thing they could just about do is agree on sanctions. And even a couple of days ago, I think Merkel still said no more sanctions today. That already looks different. And I think they had negotiations today, or will they be tomorrow um, on this? So clearly, um, we, we heard a lot of... Um, uh, the, the, or the, one of the louder voices has, has been Poland. Um, and I think the reluctant, um, as always, reluctant um, key actor has been Germany and, and Merkel. And um, there I think the shift is interesting from an originally more uh, accommodating position towards Russia based on energy interest and, and, and history. Um, there's, a, I think, a growing level of frustration um, with Russia. And it's, I think there's a switch, and that's interesting also. Um, from a sort of German political um, perspective, um, uh, a much more critical and, and, and position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, which is new for, for Germany. And at the moment, that seems to be um, the, the country that, that is most visible in whatever we call European foreign policy. And then um, clearly some countries, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe, through energy dependencies are um, um, clearly 
m questioning any kind of consensus on tougher actions or tank sanctions on Russia uh, right away, so Hungary being being one of them. So Putin is, is also kind of manipulating and cleverly buying off certain certain interests there, but he doesn't have to try very hard. They already kind of exist, all these, these different interests anyway. So one of the things I think is interesting about the EU is how for a long time, it didn't seem like Putin cared about the EU as the NATO, and how it suddenly became, in the last year and a half, a divisive issue for Putin. I mean, you know, I think that's itself kind of you know, a little bit surprising. At the same time, I mean, but, the, and, I, and I think, that what, I mean, it's interesting with Poroshenko's position, because at one level, you know, it's very similar to Kuchma. I mean, you know, Kuchma was very, sort of, at least rhetorically, intent on joining the European Union. But now it's become an issue of division you know, between East and West in a way that didn't be. It wasn't before. And I, so I, I, I guess you know, here I think the issue is the, the sort of conflict between trying to maintain territorial integrity, which means taking positions that are a consensus both in the Southeast and the West, and trying to sort of, in a sense, push um, you know, a geopolitical alliance you know, with Europe that I think many, you know, quite widely want, but are divisive within Ukraine. And I think that's, in a sense, part of the dilemma, right? I feel like um, that by sort of pushing uh, these geopolitical aims, they are making it potentially that much harder to keep Ukraine whole. And that's what I worry about, even though I, you know, personally would support those. Mm -hmm. On the, if I, if I may just couple of sentences on the divisions within the EU. I, I think some are uh, clearly predictable, the position of Poland as uh, sort of, you know, the country driving anti-Russian uh, uh, policies is, uh, uh, is very predictable and, and, uh, and obvious. Uh, what is very interesting is, uh, is that Sweden became a very strong voice in, uh, in supporting Poland in, in, in this. So, so there is this sort of Poland-Baltic uh, alliance developing, of course, three Baltic republics and, uh, and Sweden on, on the one hand. Uh, what I find surprising is that, you know, three countries which were military invaded by Russia, that is uh, Czech Republic, um, uh, Hungary, and, and um, Finland uh, are on the sort of, you know, uh, the side of the of the story, they they don't want sanctions. So I find this really surprising. Um, and 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 the traditional division within the Western core are pretty much, you know, the way they always been, right? With with the Russian, uh, with uh, with the Germans, um, you know, sort of sympathetic but despairing uh, that that the Russians are going too far and and that they need to do something about this. Um, the French, I don't think that they. Uh, have a very clear position on it, and the, the, the Southern Europeans are more sympathetic because of the energy and other things. All right? Yes, please. I'm Adam Glushenko. I'm from the law school. I'm doing a master's degree, which is LLM at the Harvard Law School. My question is about um, the precedent which was set, the positive precedent first, when Ukraine gave up 2,000 nuclear warheads, and the West and the Moscow gave its guarantees as for the territorial sovereignty, but it's not a popular subject anymore. I think people tend to overlook this and just you know ignore it for obvious reasons. But as a lawyer, you know I'm seeing the tendency to ignore the legal norms and to ignore the very foundations of international law, and that's a very dangerous precedent. You know if Russia wanted Crimea, there was a couple of ways to handle it. First, they could have bought it. I mean, let's theorize. They could have they could have bought it. Secondly, they could have gone to the International Court of Justice, which was set up just for this reason, to prevent new wars. Present their evidence. Okay, it was under Russia. It was a mistake. The procedure was wrong of giving Crimea to Ukraine. And just have a nice legal action taken. So do you think, you know, as an alternative route to taking Russia and putting it back, you know, kind of installing it back within the international legal order is a good step to initiate, you know, the, uh, to go maybe to International Criminal Court of Justice or International Court of Justice and start a proceeding there and get the judges involved, get experts involved and try to also maybe use this leverage because I don't think it's valued enough in the discussion. 
Matthew, uh, Matthew Kupfer, master's student in the Russian Eurasian Regional Studies program. I have two questions. The first one is, I hope this isn't too technical, if you could talk a bit about the Ukrainian defense industry. Ukraine has a fairly large defense industry. It produces some rather high quality missiles and other defense goods. Uh, it's export based and was described as one analyst as highly promiscuous, willing to sell to almost anyone. And also it has a lot of ties with Russia. I'm curious, uh, Russia for example can't make certain uh, missiles without Ukrainian parts. I'm curious how you think the um, defense industry will be affected or will affect the future development of Ukraine in this crisis. And second, um, recently we've seen a lot of, a good deal of censorship in Ukraine, censorship of Russian television, laws uh, discussed to restrict the import of certain books. They sense they banned a number of films after a large number after this actor from Russia fired at the Donetsk um, airport. Do you think that there's a risk in Ukraine that the need to fight this conflict uh, could actually lead to, could undermine aspects, the democratic goals of the Ukrainian revolution? I'll talk about international law and leave, leave uh, censorship for, for someone else. Maybe I'll say something about the arms industry. Um, international law, I, well, I think, I think uh, the Russians would say the U.S. undermined international law again and again and again in all the cases when we tried to bring it up. And, and we talked about Bosnia and we talked about Syria. And sorry, but we've lost patience. Um, and yes, it's too bad the United States destroyed international law, but so it goes. Um, as far as trying to bring a case, um, I don't know exactly what Russia's relationship with the ICJ is. The United States is, is not a signatory, and I think Russia would point that out fairly, fairly promptly were they brought, and of course they would do what, most, what the United States would do, which was to ignore it. Um, so, so symbolically it might, make some, might, might have some impact, but it's not going to you know, change anything um, on the ground, uh, unfortunately. Um, just briefly on the, um, the arms industry that I know a little bit about, um, I, uh, there is a lot of interdependency between the Russian and Ukrainian um, arms industries. There was some effort to start splitting that apart in the early 1990s, and uh, then they realized that it just made much more sense to get along with one another and, and go sell the stuff. Um, we'll see what happens now. My sense is that the Russians have a sense that they can and want to uh, develop the parts of the production chain um, that, they, that they don't um, already con control. Um, and so that's, you know, but they won't be able to do that right away. Uh, one last thing about, about, um, about the, the, um, the Budapest uh, agreement. Uh, I think that the effect that hasn't been talked about is, is um, it seems to me that's got to have an effect on Iran and North Korea. Which is why on earth would you agree at this point to anything like this after you see what happened uh, to Ukraine? So I, I think um, basically within Russia, I think ever since Kosovo, there's been an incredible cynicism about the West, and I think you know, really 1999, at least for personally, you know, going back to Moscow, that's really the kind of key moment when things really change. Like even the liberals, you know, start to really think that you know don't take the United States seriously at all in terms of this kind of stuff. And obviously, the, uh, the Iraq War, I think, is so. I, I, you know, I, I think for for Putin, who's you know out, cynic, out is out more cynical than just about anybody in the world. You know, I'm sure this doesn't. He you know, just figures, you know, this is what everybody does anyways. You know, Russia, sh why, why, why not Russia? Um, I think the issue with censorship, you know, I think it's, it's a concern. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure the current government has the capacity to engage in that kind of censorship. I mean, um, but I do think what's interesting is that about the shift within Ukraine, it, it, I think to a certain extent um, it has increased national unity, which is quite good. But it also means that, you know, because Ukraine has been so divided in the past, nationalism was never a force for authoritarianism because nationalism itself was so divisive within Ukraine. And now you sort of have a situation where sort of, you know, nationalism potentially could be used in a sort of more classic authoritarian fashion, given the fact that it's, you know, being invaded. That, you know, sort of it's, so in a sense, Ukraine is becoming more sort of a, a normal nation state, um, which has both good and bad aspects. Just maybe briefly also on the international law point, I mean, I completely agree with what's been said already. I think... I think we have heard a little bit about this agreement, but more in, <coughs> and maybe a bit more in Europe. Um, but it, it really shows, I think, that um, in international law is, is uh, each agreement of that kind is very case and time specific, and uh, a new political context arises, and, and it doesn't really mean all that much anymore. So, and unfortunately, 
ICC, I, IC, IC, um, International Court of Justice and the ICC, probably if a case was brought now, it would actually um, kind of embarrass international law further, which is a, a sad conclusion. So one would hope that there comes a point when it's possible again, also maybe later on to bring a case again. At the moment, it would probably be um, counterproductive because these courts don't have great records either in actually enforcing something which can in particular influence an ongoing um, crisis. I think it's a rather sad conclusion about international law not being probably just a case of all kinds of precedents. Uh, the agreements are precedents as well as breaking them. And yes, the US, many Western actors um, have broken international law. Kosovo, Russia has a point over Kosovo, um, up to a point. Um, so that's un unfortunately, I think, the, the conclusion. In terms of also censorship, um, I think probably the, the way to put it is, I mean, there's an information war going on on different sides. Huh? And also, it's not all only generated by one actor or the state or um, authorities in Kiev and Moscow. Um, and uh, I mean, very early on, this language of um, fascists versus terrorists was never very helpful. And also the language of talking about terrorists and therefore you can't engage in negotiations is clearly part of an explanation why the ceasefire agreement came so late and why it's not sticking. So I think it's, there are different um, uh, parties involved in this. And, and uh, that's one reason I think why the elections were so important to, to start rebuilding some legitimacy and get over the interim government, which could be kind of accused even more of things because they weren't, they didn't come to power through, through normal elections. But it doesn't do away with this, I think, still existing uh, reluctance to engage in negotiations. I think if any conflicts around the world teach us anything, that you need to talk even if it's, if it's not great and you don't want to talk to certain people involved in the conflicts. Ukraine may simply not have the time that some other conflicts or places where conflicts happened had to take decades to come to the conclusion you need to discuss with um, uh, the terrorists, rebels, uh, whatever they're called. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that Ukraine is still some way away from that. So if there was anything that outside actors or Western actors could go f do quite usefully is to push further for, or to push, push more for that. Mm -hmm. We are slowly uh, reaching the, the our time limit. Uh, now, um, could I ask the very familiar question? Uh, I'm not going to do this in Russian, uh, but uh, so what is to be done? Um, um, do you, what the West should do? What the US should do? Is there a way to discourage to uh, uh, Putin? Is this the way to restrict you know, the ambitions? Uh, do we have any instrument uh, 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 out there to, uh, to do it? Um. So you know, I think this is a, a very important question. I think I, and I feel like there's a kind of moral conundrum here in the sense that I think at one level what we have to do is make uh, these actions costly for Putin, right? Which involves you know strengthening Ukraine's fighting capacity and making it harder. I mean, part of the, the problem with Crimea is it was, it was so easy. You know, I think it, you know, that was a problem, right? That it was so easy. On the other hand. You know, I, you know, having studied Eastern Europe for 25 years, since you were a graduate student and I was an undergraduate, um, you know, I've always learned that things can always get worse. And so far, you know, there have been you know, about three or 4,000 deaths. Um, think Yugoslavia, there are, um, half the population of Ukraine, there are about 140,000 deaths. I mean, things could get a lot more violent. And the, and the problem is that to make it more costly f for, uh, for Putin, that involves you know, increasing the violence on the ground in, in, in eastern Ukraine, which involves, you know, you know, a lot of death and destruction. So, I, you know, I think, there's a, that, I think there's a real kind of moral problem there, right? Well, uh, let me say some big things, and then maybe I'll say some small things. Big things, I think it's incredibly important uh, for the United States to first recognize the limitation of what it can accomplish. Um, because when we sort of over-promise and over-demand, we just embarrass ourselves. Um, and, and that's really, and Putin is, is extraordinarily good at, at finding the, the ways to make that stuff seem silly. The other is to get our own house in order, um, economically um, and politically. That, that, I mean, that's, that's what Putin senses more clearly than anything, is that, is that um, the, the West is, uh, Euro, the, Euro, the European Union is weak because it's weak internally, and the United States is weak because it's economically profligate and divided politically. But, it's, but I don't think that's really the question you asked. The question uh, you know, gets to, for example, should, should the United States arm Ukrainians? And I, and I think... Um, I think Lukin's got it head on. It's a real moral dilemma. Um, it's in our interest to do so, to make Putin's life miserable. I don't think there's any chance that we're going to do enough militarily um, to really help the Ukrainians defeat the Russian army, unless the Russian army is a lot weaker than we think it is. 
Um, but it could cost tens of thousands of people their lives in the meantime. So I think um, we should say less, uh, keep the sanctions on, um, say less, and look for opportunities to make Russia's life difficult. Um, but say less. Um, I'm feeling increasingly uncomfortable with these, these military options on the table. I think um, before one would even begin to contemplate something which clearly hasn't worked further afield, I mean, look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq, why would we think it can help um, in Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis Russia? So I think there are other options that haven't really seriously been tried. And uh, one thing actually is also more serious emphasis on humanitarian aid. The West has been surprisingly slow um, so close uh, in terms of territory to, to um, take that seriously. And it's one thing to complain about so-called humanitarian aid coming in from Russia. I think the West has been uh, quite slow off the, off the mark there. But to um, engage and to, to use um, in incentives also for Ukrainian politicians or to, to broker um, uh, kind of more serious discussions inside Ukraine with, as I just said, with um, unsavory actors in, in the regions. Uh, I think there is more scope, and we, or we just don't know what the scope is. And whether Russia or representatives of Russia somehow are part of the negotiations, one can see. But I think that's where um, Western actors could try much harder. Those options have not been exhausted. Um, and this is, on the one hand, just to, uh, again, hopefully arrive at some sort of new ceasefire. But then it goes beyond that to have the negotiations in, in the regions and try whether the, maybe that adds some sort of momentum in terms of um, sussing out um, what might be acceptable to various political um, leaders in terms of, because they are, they're, they're sending very mixed messages as well, what they actually want in terms of independence, autonomy, uh, links with Russia, and so on. And then there's another thing that I think the West can usefully do um, to encourage uh, a number of structural reforms for which the elections might have created an opening. Of course, that's very hard for a government to, to do that while having to worry about its territorial integrity. But um, things like judicial reforms, this might be uh, might be one time when, when uh, certain things which are already prepared, a lot of the frustrating thing in Ukraine's case is that most of the laws exist, most of the, the experts who know kind of how to do certain things exist, but maybe this is a time when some of this can get passed and when at least a start can be made. And, and I think probably time is limited again on that, and, and maybe at least a start in judicial reform seem to, seems to be an obvious one to start with. Well, let me jump in just quickly, because I think you're absolutely right that, that really rather than talking about sort of military aid, we should be talking about how can we help the Ukrainians accept the loss of that territory. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, I, I want to disagree with you not about the idea of helping Ukraine um, um, sort of implement some of the reforms that it needs to, but just to say if, if there's something that we have a worse record at than helping, than fighting military battles around the world, mm -hmm. it's implementing domestic reform, state building, anti-corruption, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. I would say most of what we have done has been counterproductive. And I absolutely support the goal, but I just, my sense at this point in time is that our good intentions generally cause more harm than good. Maybe there is where there's a distinction between maybe also US policy and EU policy, and where something like uh, Ukraine often looking at Poland, saying let's do what Poland has done, because we're kind of like Poland, could actually have a, have a useful um, kind I of would, momentum. I would agree with you. Much, much better off. Uh, um, to take the example of Poland, who really know Ukraine so much better than, than let's say, USAID does. I agree. Um, so I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, I mean, one of the interesting things is that, you know, a lot of focus has been on Russia, whose, influence, whose behavior we have a very hard time influencing. At the same time, you know, we do, presumably, in this discussion, as long as those lines, have a, a fair amount of influence on the Ukrainian government. And I think you're right that, you know, institution building is, is very, very hard. Um, but I think you know what's perhaps is easier is getting them to avoid the sort of more sort of large scale uh, civilian uh, casualties in Donbass. You know, the use, to the extent that the use of cluster bombs is accurate. Um, you know, bombing in heavily populated areas, which seem you know counterproductive. You know, on a number of levels. But I you know I, I do feel I wonder whether we do have the capacity at least at, at bare minimum to sort of prevent the more serious violations by the Ukrainians. Please join me in thanking uh, Gwyn Sasse, Paul Danieri, <coughs> Luke Way for this very important uh, discussion. Um.